Hi, my name is Ashwin Ganabathy Raju from Rochester Institute Technology, and we'll be giving a talk on what we managed to accomplish with, uh, in the Caribbean Trapezoid using Unity Link. Hi, to everyone new who uh, didn't attend the last talk. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the Caribbean Trapezoid and what we managed to accomplish uh, using Unity Link to create you know, this wonderful sci-fi adventure for students to uh, learn. So uh, my name is Ashwin Ganapathy Raju. Over there is J. Allen Jatson. Uh, also associated with this project is Anand Manzar. I'm a fifth year game design uh, and development student pursuing a master's uh, in that field uh, at Rochester Institute of Technology. And oh, I'm going to trip over that. All right. Um, and uh, so I'm excited to share what we learned. So for those of you who didn't attend the last talk, uh, I'll give a brief rundown on what the Caribbean trapezoid actually is. Uh, so simply put, it's a mixed reality um, multimedia platform designed to create a comprehensive computational learning experience. Um, you know, we can use all the big buzzwords we want. Basically, we wanted to use music and uh, games to help students learn uh, how to think computationally while also just having a fun time doing so. So we wanted to go beyond the classic idea of, you know, 2D turtle graphics that's been a staple of uh, computer science programs forever and sort of um, give them a neat visual way to see what they're learning and have a tangible idea of what it all actually does. So to that extent, we used Unity Link, uh, which allows us to, at the time, was an unreleased technology that allowed us to bridge the gap between uh, Wolfram Mathematica and the Wolfram language and the popular Unity game engine, which is one of the most popular choices and one that I personally know as a game development student. Um, so as, since it was an unreleased technology that we basically had gotten the pre-release uh, codes for, um, we, we were basically on the cutting edge of this. Um, I don't know about many of you, but uh, if I don't know the answer to a problem, my first instinct is to Google it. That's not entirely possible when you're using a technology that hasn't been released yet. So we ended up getting very good at uh, figuring out uncreative solutions to uh, the challenges we were able to find, um, that we were able to just figure out looking at documentation and looking at uh, the examples that we'd been given. So one of the first such problems that we had run into was that you can't directly invoke a function in uh, a Unity function in a C sharp in Mathematica. You can't just say, here I have this Unity script. I want to call this, uh, this method and pass in this data to it so that it can do something. Um, so you know, early on in the planning stages, I'm coming from uh, the Unity side of things. And this caused me you know, quite a bit of stress. I can't, I can't invoke any of this code I want to write to you know, have the turtle move in a linear fashion or do any sort of animation or things like that. So we, um, we stopped and we started thinking, what did we actually need it to do? Uh, what did we actually need out of this code? What did we need Unity Link to be able to do? We needed to be able to send and receive some kind of data from, uh, you know, from the Wolfram language to Unity. We wanted to uh, tell the turtle to move forwards a unit or uh, do an animation or turn around, update its UI, things like that. So uh, what one thing that you can really do easily in Unity Link is set component properties. So if we wanted to, uh, say, pass an array of data on, well, we can just create an array of data, uh, you know, a, a double a matrix of data, really, um, that we can then set via uh, the Wolfram language in Unity Link. And the thing is that Unity then can be watching for that data to change. And the way it would go about watching whether that data has changed is by, uh, we had another variable, a Boolean that we would say, which you can see there is uh, has changes. So um, when that variable is flipped, you can see it, um, you know, it dumps it to the console so that we can make sure that we're getting the right data. And it processes the array and then turns the Boolean off again. Because that Boolean is only ever flipped by Mathematica, we, uh, by design constraint, we're able to ensure that um, we, the, the array was always only ever set by Mathematica as well, that we could, oh no, this is going to keep happening. Um, and with this, um, with this figured out, we were essentially able to um, come up with a vast array of commands that our students could use. We could have the uh, turtle move in all three axes. I, is, that, is that? Oh, it's an Amber Alert. Ah, OK. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so where was I? We were able to make the turtle move in all three axes, rotate however we'd like him to, 
uh, we were able to implement an array of like UI commands so that you could reset his state, you could reset his rotation. Um, we were able to implement a sort of level loading where uh, you could generate a series of goal posts in Mathematica that uh, students would have to get the turtle to move through in order and pass that array, that data down to uh, Unity so that it would then load those goalposts and render them in a, uh, uh, a fashion where they have a circle and a number and stuff so the students could then, you can, you can sort of see the educational challenge of um, giving the students a problem of move these goalposts in order. Uh, in order. And uh, we were able to all do this just by figuring out this uh, unconventional solution to how do we send data down in a way that Unity can pick up through its own update loops and whatnot. So another problem that we ended up running into um, a little bit was that Unity Link by its nature and even now in the uh, um, version 12 release, um, as I understand it, you still need a Unity project in order to use Unity Link. You cannot create a build of the uh, executable that can connect to the Wolfram kernel. So this wasn't as much of an issue for us once we stopped to think about it because our students will be okay especially as, Unity, as the Unity game engine is free, to uh, be able to just open up this Unity project we send them and share it. But uh, it, it did pose a bit of a challenge because we also wanted to be able to hide some of the stuff that they don't need to worry about from their view. But we decided, OK, we'll just tell them if they want to see how this all works, they can do so. But uh, we don't have to worry. But for now, you don't have to worry about it. You can send these commands through the Wolfram language. And feel free to explore if you like. Um, something we ended up running into was that, well, as we were developing this uh, project, we wanted to be able to uh, create these different levels, create these different scenes, and you know, have a little um, scene for testing out animation without having to load up the big, you know, very large um, main game scene. But we wanted um, Mathematica to be able to synchronize to the start scene so that it could find all the variables it needed to update and change and things like that. So we ran into a similar issue of, well, we can't do scene, as of 11.3, uh, we couldn't do scene loading through Mathematica. So we ended up engineering this uh, game object that by design would show up on every uh, scene that we would basically flip the variable, uh, a variable property of. Um, and so Mathematica would check whether this variable uh, was telling it to hold up, we're not in the start scene yet, please wait, and then it would go to sleep for a couple of seconds and then try again because scene loading can be difficult. And by engineering this uh, solution, we were able to make it so that uh, when Mathematica tried to connect to Unity, it would always be able to, t Unity would always hop over to the start scene so that the connection could complete successfully. And both the uh, kernel would wait and Unity would transition and it would um, operate well. We also ended up designing two modes that students could uh, use in their, uh, exploration of this thing. We called one of, it, one of them link mode, which is this sort of thing I've been telling about where you can send commands and move the turtle around and do stuff like that. And we also had uh, what we called cinematic mode, which we might have, which you know, we're planning to add like a story, uh, more of the story to with voice acting and uh, uh, a sort of narrative tale. But we also wanted it so that in this cinematic mode where you have direct control in the Unity engine itself, which is also useful for just making sure that the scene we've uh, created works well in game, um, how do you make it so that you don't have to worry about any Mathematica commands coming in and interpreting? So that isn't just like, oh, we have a Boolean flipped in uh, Unity, don't process anything that comes in from the uh, array I showed you earlier. We also needed to tell Mathematica so that a student might, uh, would know, oh, right, I selected cinematic mode, I shouldn't be trying this. So we ended up sort of doing the same thing in reverse. We had a variable that would uh, be changed by Unity, um, but would be watched by Mathematica whenever it tried to. Uh, we had it so that when you called the start command that would uh, try and connect, it would wait for you to select this dialog box, whether you were in link mode or cinematic mode. And then based on your selection here, it would flip a variable that Mathematica would be watching for, and only then would that execution of that start command finish on the Mathematica side so that uh, it would know what state it was in, it would flip a Boolean behind the scenes, and none of the commands would execute. So another thing we wanted to do is provide all sorts of controller support uh, for students to be able to sort of visualize things, because a lot of people nowadays are familiar with like 
at spots, controllers, and the like. So we wanted to be able to um, use those to help further the mixed reality part of our mixed reality platform. So we basically used Mathematica's full uh, controller uh, integration in order to support uh, PS4 controllers, Xbox controllers, and the like, and have those set up so that they can send, uh, so that they would both in a uh, dynamic module display what commands you were sending by moving your uh, joystick forwards, you were sending a aim move forward command, and then you could also send those straight down so that we weren't even just using the uh, built-in Unity controller support, but we were doing it through Mathematica, in part to uh, just to see whether we could, but also because it was uh, something we thought that, ah, oh, no, it's the third time now. I should, I should really keep touching, just moving my touchpad every few seconds, um, uh, just to show that we could, and also just so that students could start thinking, OK, if I want to do this, well, when I you know, move these controllers in order, it's showing me a list of the commands that it would uh, process, oh, I can just type those to solve this challenge without using the controller as well. Um, we're also working on Wiimote support. Um, if you were here at the last talk, uh, Professor Jatson mentioned that there would be uh, sort of dolphins that kids could play with with wearables and stuff. They have a nice convenient pouch you can put a uh, Wiimote into, so we started exploring whether we could use Wiimotes in Mathematica to you know, pull accelerometer data, uh, use the speakers to make dolphin sounds, etc. As it turns out, um, at least on Windows, while Windows can pick up a, 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 a Wiimote via Bluetooth, it doesn't actually understand the input it's sending. So I ended up designing a, a WSTP link program that would connect to these Wiimote drivers uh, using the uh, Wii Yourself library and would also create a, um, and also send that data up to Mathematica so that we could pull it and uh, connect there. Uh, and uh, be passed forward into uh, Unity. So it's still a bit finicky. We're still working out some of the bugs on that, so it's not really ready for a demo yet, but it's, uh, it was, we have the data coming out to Mathematica, but the Wiimotes we have are a bit old and end up just uh, breaking on stage, so we thought it was better not to uh, display that. Um, so, oh. so moving forwards, our plans are to uh, fully integrate the Wiimotes into the whole its reality system so that uh, kids can play with the dolphins and uh, see that display as a little song and dance routine on the screen. Uh, we want to add some more generative content to the level using Mathematica to create you know, uh, procedurally crafted coral or uh, interesting schools and uh, AI behavior and things like that. Um, as the uh, class, move, class that this is uh, being used in moves forward, if there's any commands the students request that uh, you know, they need like, oh, hey, I would like it if I could do this. Uh, we'll move forward to adding those. We want to work on story mode a bit more. And we're definitely going to continue working on this, uh, you know, over the next summer and over the school year and stuff like that. So uh, thank you. I'm, I'm not quite done yet. I'm going to start showing some demos and some uh, of the actual uh, stuff here. But that's most of the PowerPoint. Um, So we created a uh, riffraft package that holds all of our commands and all of our Unity link integration so that students weren't, um, so that this could be used in, say, a computational essay with just an initialization cell at the start and things like that. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and run all those. So load AMPS uh, is almost a wrapper around the Unity open function that allows you to uh, just load up Unity from a project. It passes in the right folder that it figures out because of uh, where it's always saved in relation to the riffraff package. Um, it also does some basic initialization of variables that it needs to do. And so uh, I will also load a MIDI file that we've pre-created um, using Mathematica, I believe, so that I can show you how we have song and dance type stuff implemented. So we hit start on uh, the Unity project, and from there we can start this connection. I was already on the start scene, so it's not visible, but uh, actually let me start from not the start scene just to sort of show you what I mean there. Uh, but um, no, I'll start from main. This takes a second. So if I were to start Unity in any scene that I wanted, we solved a synchronization lock problem by um, basically being able to, and you can see this uh, log uh, on the right here, 
but it's starting the connection, it's connected to Unity, it's found that the process exists, uh, it, tells it, uh, it tells Unity to switch to the start scene, and it does so automatically. It then awaits the choice of start mode. You know, as I mentioned before, link mode and cinematic mode uh, can all be used for um, various purposes. In this case, I'll use link mode. Let me also connect my controller as that starts up. Um, so now we've started up in link mode. So in this state, the turtle won't do anything by itself. You can you know, press WASD or use a controller in Unity all you'd like. It won't do uh, anything because in this state, it's waiting for commands uh, from uh, Mathematica. So we have a delayed execution model where students can uh, execute a number of commands in order and it'll build them into this list in, this, in the uh, behind the scenes. Uh, so it's only ever sent over when you, we execute this um, AIMS execute command here. So in this case, I'm just going to tell uh, AIMS to move forward five units, one after another, and send that data down. So you can kind of see in Unity, but it's sent that data over and AIMS will you know, swim forwards five units. You can see it updating in this uh, movement history, which is scrollable, et cetera. Um, there's, always, there's also, of course, like reset aims if you want to um, reset his position or things like that. You can imagine that being useful between scenes or between uh, exercises, which is just another type of command uh, that gets sent over. Um, we can also, uh, I've been told there's no speakers, so uh, this will be playing a uh, MIDI song from Mathematica as it uh, synchronizes with Unity, but we can all hum along, I guess. So you can sort of see the patterns on the back of AIMS changing. That is in synchronization to um, the MIDI song that's currently playing. Uh, I, could, I could probably put it up on my speakers, but uh, I'm not sure that's fair to any of the people listening from the video. But uh, uh, <laughs> so this, this can be created, and there's um, a whole set of lectures about uh, what these patterns represent and how they re relate to the piano keyboard and things like that that we'll be having our students do. Um, but because the students will be able to basically craft uh, these songs themselves and pass them over, uh, they can kind of, they get to kind of see the dances and songs they create. Uh, speaking of dances, there's also animation we can run. Right now, uh, N and K don't really mean anything. They're sort of just, um, we haven't actually named the animations yet to like uh, dance left or dance right, they just use the alphabet for now um, because uh, our animator has a bit of a sense of humor there. But uh, if you, we run N, you can see that we can send a command and similar to any of the other commands, it does a little flip. And uh, as it turns out, K is a flip in one of the other axes. So if I were to run that, he does another spin. So um, once we actually get the proper names for those, that'll be uh, a lot more usable for the students. Um, and uh, that's, that's a lot of it. Oh, there's also the controller. I can't believe I forgot about the controller. That's why I plugged it in. Um, so if we connect the controller, let's hope this works. Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't run that. Whoops. Oh, no. Ah, there we go. All right. So if I push forwards on the joystick, you can kind of see that it's saying, oh, yeah, you're moving aims forward one. Uh, so I can do that in any of the directions, and it will uh, parse that. I can turn the uh, other joystick to change its angle. Um, so you can see there's like multiple commands here, and if I tap any, tap any one of the um, back uh, bumper keys, it will actually send those commands that are currently active. So you can see that it sent multiple commands, you know, turn a couple of times and then move forwards, things like that. So if that always, if that gets, you know, confusing in the, uh, student has managed to run themselves into the ground or something, there's always commands you can send. You can use the uh, start or select we defined as you know, resetting rotation or resetting the whole scene or things like that. Uh, we've made it so that you can change the speed of the turtle through uh, an AIMS speed command. Let me actually get rid of the dynamic cell so I don't accidentally push the joystick and have something run. But uh, we can do like, we can get speed or just pass in a new speed of say, you know, 25 units a second. Um, so then if we were to tell AIMS to move five units forwards, well, he'll end up going quite fast, um, you know, sailing through this mysterious underwater Caribbean trapezoid. Um, so there's all sorts of uh, neat little things that are 
uh, available in the Unity scene and we're adding to it more and more as we get more models in and more uh, content created for students to explore. And as I said, there's a story mode that'll be coming in. And we hope that this will be useful for crafting a, uh, you know, a, a fun way for students to learn because they can actually see all the stuff that's happening on the screen in a Unity pop-up, as it were. So uh, that's pretty much all from me. Thank you for coming. And there's the five-minute mark. So uh, I'll take any questions if you have any.